Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I am delighted to be joined. It's a full house. It's Chris McElwain. It's Lloyd Patrick Jepson's return, coming back like CCV, and Brian Degnan as well. It's the back four. Gentlemen, we have loads to discuss, and obviously we've got a massive game. This weekend, the tagline, how can Celtic continue scintillated form at Tencastle? We're going to be running through the team from back to front, uh, talking about where we are, where we're going, and whether or not you actually think there should be any changes. Lloyd, Patrick Jepson, you've been watching us for the last few weeks. What have you made of this topsy-turvy Celtic season over the last few weeks? Uh, the, la the last few weeks have been um, interesting, to say the least, because you obviously we've all spoke about performances and how they've not improved throughout the whole season, and they've just continued to just drag on. And then you get... When, you know, obviously, you get the second half against Motherwell, which was great. 93rd minute and that again, you win. And then you get that on Wednesday, which was just... Where's that Celtic been all season? That is that is Celtic at their best, the way they performed on Wednesday. And it's frustrating to watch at the same time because you're like to yourself, you know they've got it in them. They could have done that so early on in the season and we wouldn't be sitting here today going, well, we're two points behind in the league because literally we were so miles ahead, the league should already be wrapped up. Yeah, it's frustrating when you see it because on the one hand, you're absolutely delighted and obviously you're enjoying it and the roar at half time and everybody seems to be on the same page again. Um, it really brings us all back together, Brian. I was talking yesterday to a pal of mine. I was saying that, you know, we, we come on the show regularly criticising players' performances, managers' decisions, boardroom, um, lack of ambition and vision. But the minute somebody else starts slagging off Celtic, we all come together. It galvanises us. Um, how big a part do you think that's played over the last couple of weeks? Well, I think we, you and I, were criticised a few weeks back prior to the Kilmarnock game because we said the best version of Brendan Rodgers is the Brendan Rodgers who's back against the wall when, when it seems like everything's against him. And we saw that a couple of times this season where things have kicked in. So, it, you know, you talk about criticism. I've been very critical of Rodgers this season, and um, I may be the, the slightly, I may take over Jim's role temporarily as the grumpy old guy in the show because I've got a couple of things that I, I think we probably need to flag in, in the midst of the, the euphoria. But yeah, I think that that sort of, the sort of press attacks on the good girl comment, which were ludicrous, the sort of criticism of the team. You know, Brendan getting a bit prickly. I think that's all he's changed tact a bit. And I don't think Rogers does anything by accident. I think that at the start of the season, he was being a bit coy about things. Then he was sort of having a little dig at some of the players. Then it was transfers. And he was trying to get different reactions for different things. Now I think the message is, everyone thinks we're a joke. Everyone thinks we've lost it. We're going to get beat. Let's show them. Let's write our own story to, to quote the, the new tagline. Maybe get that in a T-shirt. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that's the, it's had the right reaction. And the Hearts game, which we'll get to, is going to be massive for that. Because you had a terrible first half against Motherwell, but the mentality we all speak about kicked in. And they dug in and they had a good performance in one. And then they came out the traps against Dundee and absolutely ran riot. So if we could do something similar against Hearts, then you can really see that actually, you know what, now it's clicked. You know, it's, it's it's been a long time coming. But ultimately, if it gets to the end of the season and we're champions again, then I think we can look back and that mother game is a real turning point. Yeah, um, absolutely. We've been looking for a turning point, Chris, haven't we? We've been talking about it. We've been trying to extract one at every turn. I said uh, at Easter Road, Ida, is it a turning point? Actually, it might well be because he's a guy that could well be one of the most important players for us over the next few months. But um, it certainly feels that way. Uh, I know you guys, I was listening in, you were saying we're trying not to get you know, too overexcited about this and overreact to the fact that we've, we've played well for a game and a half. Um, some yesterday don't even think we played that well in the second half against Dundee. Yeah, you've got to temper the enthusiasm, Chris, uh, on one hand, but you've got to enjoy the fact that we played with the shackles off the other night as well. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've spoken before about there being moments that we'll look back on this season that, that we'll either use as catalyst, turning point, uh, springboard, you know, get the collection going off. Uh, we're going to use everyone in the book today. But I think the, the, the point is, yeah, it, 
we take that game in isolation, it's brilliant, especially the first half. It was like old style Celtic. It was like what we want to see on the park. Team looked connected. Energy levels were great. I don't know if Dundee were having an off night or we. I'm prepared to think we just didn't let them play just by virtue of you know how we uh, how we approached the game uh, right for the start. I thought that, I thought the the effort and the the application was tremendous. Um, but again, I, I, you know, I think Brian makes a good point. I think we've got to be careful. Let's not. Hopefully, this isn't a false dawn. Hopefully, we're not going to Tyne Castle at the weekend, and and you know, we'll revert back. I think we have to. Hopefully, uh, you know, as a team, we have to use this as a springboard to keep the momentum levels up. Really put the the onus on Rangers to win every game by virtue of doing what we need to do. Uh, mm-hmm. Beat everybody in front of us, um, and and you know, if it comes down to those, uh, you know, the games against Rangers. Well, let's make sure we're going to them on the best possible form. It's a nice, connected team. Uh, guys high on confidence and looking like we can beat anybody they put in front of us. So that's, I think, I think, yeah, great to see. Hopefully, as you say, that's us come the corner now and we're onwards and upwards. Yeah, I would uh, subscribe to that. We're going to be talking about the fixtures between now and the next game against Rangers. Jungle Lion raises the fact that no Rogers or McGregor at training today. Sick, maybe. Um, I know that uh, Sky Sports, I think, had a, a reporter up there um, looking at their training. There was no Callum McGregor. There was no Brendan Rogers. I'm just putting it down to it's now Callum's shot to watch that documentary about the wee girl that was travelling around the world on a boat. Um, so they were just sitting there taking notes, <laughs> watching the dock. There's nothing to be worried about. There's no sickness or injuries. Um, now, Graceful Shambles, afternoon axon. Young James flying the flag on MSM. Cracking lad, keep it up. Uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, because he is a cracking lad, is young James. He is young. He's 20-year-old, um, more than half my half my age um, and also you know when anybody um, you know dips their toe into the MSM waters they, there's a level of criticism so that's the reason I brought that up because I just think that I've heard all the reasoning behind it they're no friends of Celtic um, their employment uh, rules might go against people who support Celtic in the past etc I've heard it all and I've, I've, I'm just of the view that we'll buck the trend Throw throw a discerning voice into the mix, um, rather than complain about the fact that there are no Celtic voices on certain platforms or channels. If you get the opportunity, go and speak uh, your mind. And obviously, James knows what he's getting into. Strong lad, um, and his video on Twitter alone um, has had over half a million views. So fair play to James. Big future ahead of him, and you hope that he can follow in the footsteps of Alexei Amy Canavan, who has done phenomenally well since uh, leaving us all behind to talk about Celtic. Uh, let's, let's have a wee chat then about the fixtures. Lloyd, um, you're back in and we're talking obviously about winning every game and then it comes down to the big derbies. So Celtic, obviously, we're going to be focusing quite a bit on the Hearts game coming up. But our run of fixtures before we face Rangers at Ibrox are as follows. Hearts away, Livingston at home, St Johnston at home, Livingston away. And of course, the first game against Livy is in the Scottish Cup. So mm. we've got four games before we face Rangers. Rangers, these fixtures are as follows. So they're playing Motherwell at home tomorrow. They've then got Europa League action away to Benfica. Scottish Cup quarter final against Hibs away. Europa League, um, the return fixture against Benfica, Ibrox. Dundee away, Hibs at home, and then they face us. Um, so you, you know straight off the bat, a couple of extra fixtures for Rangers. How big is that going to be at this stage of the season? I, I'm not saying I would rather not be in Europe. I would much rather be in Europe. How big is it going to be, though, when you think about the travel to Benfica and the extra game at home, you know, two extra fixtures before the players? Is it no, pivotal? It, it could be pivotal because they do say momentum is massive in football. So you're looking at those fixtures and when they're in Europe, what if they get beat? What if they beat heavily? Is that going to be confident? I mean, you look at Wednesday, has momentum shift now? Where we've still not lost a game this year. So you've got to take that on board as well. These these next four fixtures are going to be crucial in where the league's going to go. Mm-hmm. And I, I do believe all we just need to focus on is what we do. It's not about what Rangers do, it's just what Celtic do. As long as we are getting the results, 
that puts more pressure back on them because tomorrow they'll probably put pressure on us because I just expect them to win anyway. That's the best way to look at it. They win, five points difference. Go to Tyne Castle, right, we need to cut that gap again and then we just keep that going, momentum going right through the Ibrox. You're right, and the momentum, uh, Brian, has been huge. Uh, the momentum shift, we've been hearing all about it, all the cliches are getting rolled out and we're talking about pendulums and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, Lloyd is correct. On on the one hand, you want to completely focus on the job at hand, which is your own fixtures. But I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, aye, a couple of tricky ones in there, in between the Scottish Cup game, in between the league games, Brian. You could even be talking about momentum, you could be talking about injuries, fatigue, that kind of thing. I think it plays a part. I think it always plays a part. I think it's you always focus on yourself, but you know, it, whatever happens across the city does have some form of effect. What will be interesting is we, we spoke at the start about the siege mentality and that idea of suddenly being sort of underdogs. Um, and I think that if they do start to slip up and we become favourites again, does that galvanise us to, to push even further? Or are we better chasing at the moment until we get to the Rangers game? So it'll be interesting to see psychologically how that works. But ultimately, if I'm being honest, I think that and again, we, we said that a couple of weeks ago that I think you just you dig in. Brendan can win the big games. He's shown that. The players have got the mentality to dig in when they need to. And I think that's what's going to ultimately see us over the line. And I think that if we really focus on that and what we can do, I think we'll be fine. And it's actually one of the interesting things about you know the, the performance against Dundee because when you talk about simplicity... I think we've been guilty of overcomplicating things this season in terms of how we play. Yeah. So many times our wingers have cut in or Taylor's come in and Ralston's come in and it's just it's it's been trying it's like someone trying to copy Angelo and it's not worked. And I think that's why Kyogo struggled. Whereas against Dundee, it went right, fullbacks overlap, wingers stay outside and cross in. If you can't cross, you've got a winger a, a fullback overlapping and cross it in. I think three of the goals came from crosses. Mm-hmm. Um, and players coming into the box late and it was relentless it was like centre back straight to the winger of the full back straight into the box and it was straight and it was simple and it was really effective and I think that's where Ida was really key because what he'd done off the ball was enough to make space for other people running into the box where that changed sadly was the second half when he came off and Kyogo came on mm-hmm. because we started overcomplicating that again no that blaming Kyogo I think it's a disgrace he's not been used properly this season. And I think that's Roger's fault. But you saw a real difference in Yang in the second half. He started suddenly trying to jink in, suddenly trying to cut in instead of doing what he'd been doing. I think even Peter Grant was, was shouting about it in commentary on Celtic TV saying, just stick to what's been working. Just get the balls into the box. So it would be interesting to see how we perform. And I think the, the message to Brendan was, look, we know we're the best. Let's keep it simple. Let's not overcomplicate it. Let's just go out, be relentless and win this game. And I think that's probably what should be the, the sort of mantra going forward. I know I've jumped a few steps ahead because we're going to be talking about teams and stuff, but I think that, you know, you did see a tale of two sides and two halves um, on Wednesday. And I think the first half is what I want to see moving forward. Just simple, direct, aggressive. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't fit square pegs into round holes. And I think we'll be okay. Yeah, I I would agree with that. And you're right, there has been uh, periods where you think it's getting a wee bit overcomplicated. And I felt that in the early parts of Ange Postecoglou's time as well, I just felt that there was players adapting to a system, took them a wee while, then eventually it did click. Um, I don't think anything is going to click as such. I just think it's been simplified in regards to uh, yep. Brendan over the last few weeks. Um, I'm really keen to bring in some of the uh, the comments that are coming through, so keep them coming. Lloyd's dropped out. I don't know if he's maybe uh, his device has died on him uh, or if there's a, a Wi-Fi issue, but if he comes back in, we will bring him back because it was a fleeting appearance from uh, the Wonder Boy. Um, I want to speak also about the support we're getting from uh, our viewers. It's, it's phenomenal. I, I mentioned yesterday on the socials, 15 million plus views just on the YouTube channel. Um, and just to show you how you know sensational that is, nobody else on the planet other than Celtic have got a Celtic channel that, with that amount of views 
on the YouTube. So that that is sensational. That really is. Um, and I'm going to take this opportunity to say that that um, board behind you, I don't know if it's a bookshelf, that's sensational as well. Is that the Celtic jersey you've got on that, Chris? That's a brilliant well, bit of product placement, mate. Well done. How, how, did, you, how did you guess? How did you guess? <laughs> it's tremendous. I never even told you. You can come on the show as long as you put my book in the background and then I can mention it, etc., etc. No, but thank you very, very much, every single one of you. And then it, there's, there's a knock-on effect here because when we're doing something, for example, um, fundraising for charitable uh, causes, because you're, you're building it up and building up all the time, there's more of an impact. And that, that's, that's huge. We've, Obviously, as a team, as a community, the Axon community has raised over £100,000 for good causes in the last four years, and we continue to do that. Um, starting today, we will be listing uh, items that have been donated by people who watch the show, and we're going to be auctioning them off for we, we Jamie Tierney. There's also uh, a drive at the Swindon CSC. Brian, you want to bring us up to date with the drive this weekend? Yeah, so we've got a big weekend uh, in the, the Swindon CSC. Um, we've got a, a real drive to, for uh, Easter, egg, Easter egg collections for some of the youngsters in the community that uh, maybe aren't as fortunate as others. And we really want to try and get as much sort of support for that as possible. Um, and one of the reasons, one of the things to drive that, we've got a fantastic uh, signer coming down on Sunday. So the idea is we'll have a Easter egg collection in the morning and watch the game, hopefully celebrate. And then we've got a, a, a live signer on for the rest of the afternoon. It's free entry. We just ask that you come down and try and make a donation or a contribution to the, the, the Easter egg collection. Um, these things are always for a good cause. And I think if anyone follows the, the Swindon CSC on Twitter or um, Instagram, we'd have saw that we, uh, we also had a massive sort of uh, football tops collection for the kids in Sierra Leone. That was incredible, that. Brilliant. Which was, and now, you, just for some context for people, we've only got, we've got 40 odd members in the CSC in a short space of time, which is good, but the amount of jerseys we got from everyone was was absolutely incredible. It was such an incredible drive, so we really want to keep that going. And if there's anyone watching from sort of Bristol, Gloucester, Cheltenham, London, any surrounding areas, please come down. It's I say, it's free entry. It'll be a good laugh. It's always great crack with the boys. There's an Indian restaurant next door that we, we've got a partnership with, so there'll probably be some grub in the go. Um, and it's really good to see everyone. So, so please get doing it. It's for a great cause. We've we've really been pushing the charity work, and it's it's you know guys like uh, Spike, who's a member, um, Big Joe helped organise the the t-shirt collection. Marshall, the chairman, Joe, all the rest of the guys at the committee. It's been a great effort. Um, so you know, and thanks for Axon for promoting it as well. So please get doing. Yeah, get involved. It's for a great cause. It's to help some of the kids. And you'll have a great day, and it's free entry. So. It's a it's a, a, a risk free strategy. It was like when we signed Aaron Moy, a risk free strategy. So come on down. Superb. Come on down. Price is right. Um there he is. There's the man. Lloyd is back. Sorry, mate, we lost you for a wee while there, but you're back. Um and he's wearing that long sleeved Celtic. It always looks brilliant in long sleeve, the green and white hoops, doesn't it? Um Chris, we're talking about momentum swings and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but looking at the fixtures, obviously. You know, there's nothing guaranteed. You know, we've made it difficult for ourselves against clubs that, you know, you would expect to beat, uh, particularly at Celtic Park. That That's why we are where we are, really, um, against these lesser, in inverted commas, uh, clubs. So when you're looking at the fixtures, and it's the biggest cliche in football game at a time, even Brendan said it, do you tend to look ahead to that Rangers game and think, well, there's a block of fixtures, and it's all about building momentum within that four or five games? Well, it's a luxury of being a supporter, right? We can do that. We can look ahead to the games. But I'm sure in that dressing room, they're, they're just looking no further than the, the you know the game on Sunday. Um, but yeah, I think momentum's key here. Uh, look, I don't think we're going to go into uh, every one of the next games and win by six goals or seven goals. I would love it to happen, but I think we've got to be realistic. You know, teams are going to adapt to what they've seen on Wednesday. You know, the, the, I'm sure the you know the the Hearts managers probably you know showing the boys tapes of that and saying right, we kind of let that happen. Um, but what I what I really liked when I was watching the game on uh, on uh, Wednesday, and it, uh, it echoes what the guys have said. Uh, things looked simpler. They looked more direct. They looked simpler. Everybody seemed to understand what their role was, and I, I thought nobody really exemplified that more than Yang. Uh, and Yang's been criticised by lots of people this season, including myself. Um, but he looked 
much he actually looked much more comfortable on the ball, looked much mm. more comfortable in terms of what he was being asked to do. The connection with Johnson on that, that right hand side really paid dividends, looked great. Um and I thought, you know, there's a player there. That's that's what we've been wanting to see. You know, he wasn't trying to overcomplicate it, he wasn't trying to do things that that um, you know, he's been doing in the past where maybe trying to beat too many players, um, and then eventually losing it at the last you know, the last final ball. I thought he really exemplified a, a much more simpler, direct and focused style of play. And I think we, we have to stick with that now. We have to stick with that mindset, that attitude on the park, that level of determination. And every time we get three points now, it's just building more and more momentum. None of the games are going to be easy. None of the games are going to be are going to be walkovers. I don't believe the game on Wednesday was a walkover. And actually, you saw that in the second half. That you know, It was much more difficult uh, after that, that surge in the first half. Um, great to see the young boy Dan Kelly come in and get a cracking goal uh, by the way I mean, what a moment for him um, but you can see that trying to sustain that momentum from the first half is, is a challenge so taking that game to game is going to be a, going to be a greater challenge but you know what as Jerry says I'm here for it I'm up for it I'm looking forward to watching it and if we can build on that performance up to the point where we're playing Rangers and look you know Rangers they do what they do. I'm, a, I'm a, with the guys. It's, I'm more focused on what we're doing as a team. But I would love us to get to the Rangers game. And if it is down to the, you know, getting the three points um, against them and we've built up that momentum, oh, I'll tell you what a game it will be. You know, what, what a game it will be. And um, that, talk about moments, there's your big moment towards the end oh, of the season. Oh, yes, yes. It is. It's going to be huge, um, Chris. Absolutely huge. By the way, one final point on that book that's behind you. Don't tend to push that on the show. Did you buy that from the Axom shop, Chris? Genuine question, did you? No, I didn't because I wasn't aware of the Axom shop at that time. That's so I'm, I'm sorry to say I didn't, but I have bought an Axom mug, which is hopefully getting dispatched and delivered. So, Brilliant. Uh, next time I'm go. Go, I'll have the, the Axom mug. You need an Axel mug. Uh, keep your eyes on the old... <laughs> keep your eyes, absolutely, on the old uh, Axel.net because in the ne next 24 hours, the shop will be relaunched with new gear on there as well. And my book's going to be on it. Kevin Graham's book's going to be on it. Uh, and whatever the Axel troops are up to, will be supporting various uh, theatre events, etc., uh, on there as well. So keep an eye on it. The link is under the video. Kevin Mullen, afternoon, Axel. Afternoon to you as well. Happy Friday to you all. Uh, listening from Sonny Airdrie, painting away. Are you painting at home, Kevin? Are you a painter and decorator and you're on a job? Let us know in the comments section. We want to know where you are painting. And it's Sonny Airdrie. You go from Sonny Airdrie to Snowy Dublin and Jungle Lion. Let us know where you're watching a Celtic State of Mind today. You and boy Martin, who this week became a granddad. Yeah, the big fella. Game on Sunday is massive and we'll show if we really are up for the fight to win this title. This is a thing because when it comes down to uh, where we've been this season, for example, Lloyd, you go and you watch us at home. Uh, actually, you know what? All three of the Champions League games at home, including Lazio, where we got beat, I just think it gave us food for thought. We we're looking at the side after these games thinking we might be all right, actually. You know, we're playing top quality sides and we're doing really well. We were a boot lace off uh, going ahead, you know, against uh, Lazio going through one up. And we're very unlucky. We beat, uh, we drew with Atletico Madrid. We beat Feyenoord, and, and of course the two games against Rangers. So there's been moments this season, Lloyd, where we've been sitting here on a, a Friday thinking, yeah, we've turned a corner, and then it's the return of the performances that are getting of getting us concerned. How do you avoid that, Lloyd? How do you do it? Because I've just been saying all week, play the guys that are on form, play your, play Yang, play Tomoki Awata, play Ida. I think that's the key. Yeah, hundred percent. I think. Looking at the team, <clears throat> excuse me, when look at the team that finished at Fir Park and then look at the team that started on Wednesday, it looks more settled and a lot more balanced. And what in I look at Dan Johnson's relationship on Wednesday and I look at Taylor and Mayader's relationship down the wings, both were bombing beyond the wingers as well. So it the team looks a lot more settled now. A lot in the middle of the park frees up McGregor a lot more frees up O'Reilly a lot more because they know fine well they've got an assurance behind mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. to drop into that defence as well and Ida he, listen we've all kind of criticised him and it was no fault of his own that we criticised him it's obviously the way the transfer window worked out in January that we were kind of expecting this quality that we've been promised the hopeful window but 
and the boys came in and sometimes certain players are just destined to play for this club and I think that boy is. He really, really is. He needs five goals, five games, two headers. He's he's done the job so far. Aye. And an assist as well, by the way, Lloyd. Right. Um, destined to play for a club. I love that. That's that's cracking. Uh, who was it that was mentioned earlier? You've got to put something on a T-shirt. Was that Brendan Rodgers writing your own story? Was that you, Brian, that said that? Aye. That, that's what we tend to do as a football club. It was bringing back the thunder. It was the Ronnie roar. It was all that kind of stuff. I mean, we never stopped with Ange. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Always looking for an opportunity. <laughs> Jamie Young. Hail, hail, one and all. We have a league to win. Keep it up, boys. Yeah, we do, Jamie. And we're in a title fight. And I, I'm going to ask you, Brian, because um, I was talking earlier to someone uh, about actually just out of reach. I can see it. My very first game, I went to Tommy Burns' testimony in 1987. And since then, till now, the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs. But I was chatting um, to a pal earlier about the fact that, you know, sometimes we panic when things aren't going well. And we do. And there's been this big conversation around um, the the kind of mood and the emotion and the energy coming from the fans onto the park. Um, and some people that I've been speaking to on Axon reckon that it's, uh, you know, don't blame the fans kind of thing. The other, the other point is that energy comes from the performance on the pitch. Where are you with it, Brian? Because, you know, imagine being a Celtic fan and going to the games over the last 20 years. All you've really seen is success. There's been a few wee blips along the way. Not a great deal. Not a great deal. You know, when Lenny came in, we had won the league for three seasons. But, I mean, other than that, it's, it's a league title here or there. That, that's it. So I can understand, and I don't have a dig at any fan who's watched Celtic for the last 20 years, who get a bit impatient, who get a bit angry at a poor performance because they're no used to seeing it, Brian. Well, it's not just that. I think what's important to remember is people work really, really hard mm-hmm. um, to, to get money, to go to games, to take the family to games, to buy strips, to go on away trips, to do whatever they can. And even people that maybe can't afford it, a lot of their, their certain people that maybe aren't well off or, or maybe not doing well, they, their escape from life is watching Celtic play. So they, they've got every right to not be happy with what's on show. They've got every right to, to say, oh, I'm not, I don't think this is acceptable. And I would push back strongly against people blaming the fans or saying, oh, the fans have no right to do or no right to do this. Fans could do what they want. They're working hard and paying their money, sacrificing for the club that they love. And I don't think that should ever be tempered. I would never say to say the fan, listen, love the club a bit less, will you? Because the, the manager thinks you're annoying the players. No, not at all. And, and I think it's, I think it's really poor to do that because even my sort of stance aside in terms of why support should be appreciated, the the team go out there and perform and they say, oh, we need the fans on side. Okay, you get 60,000 fans in all the time. All the time the fans are there. You mentioned Tommy Burns. They're there and they're always there. And that's not going to change. But you've got a duty to go out there and perform, to play the Celtic being put on a show. And it, it... People say, oh, you, you, you lose a game, it's a disaster. I've watched Celtic lose games, but go down swinging, but play well, but just don't quite get away with it. And it's not a disaster. I don't see people screaming and shouting and bawling. Where some of the, the sort of annoyance from the fans has came is the performances have been terrible. We've came for a terrible one inside to a side that at times has been terrible to watch, COVID season stuff. We've got a manager that's actively at times criticise the fans we've got a board who doesn't seem to engage at all so the, the, the fans have every right to, to not be happy with what they're seeing and the right to show it and I think that if fans were to certain lower standards and accept what was on offer then they wouldn't be the atmosphere at Parkhead and it wouldn't have the influence in the team anyway so there's this symbiotic relationship correct but for anyone you know for a manager getting paid X amount of money the highest paid safety manager ever to say I don't think the fans are helping the players my advice would be, why don't you get down to brass tacks, you make sure the players are performing and then the fans will get on side the same as they have long before you were here and long after you will be. So, I, uh, you can tell when I actually, I'm not, I'm not happy with that. That for me is punching down. That's people not taking accountability or responsibility and that's something that I have little tolerance for. Rant over. Well said. You are taking the place of Jim off today, well, Brian. I was going to say, is that- is that Jim? Is he in the wardrobe? Is he in the wardrobe? Bye. And he's it, actually, it looks as though Lloyd's getting filmed outside the wardrobe. Is it Tony's wardrobe that you're getting filmed outside? The Lion, the Witch, and the wardrobe. Here we go. Um, what brought to mind? 
talking about uh, performances and, and being uh, obviously not not spoiled, absolutely not spoiled, but being used to a, a successful side. I think back, and I was talking uh, about this because we were uh, in conversation with Excel over the last wee while, and I, I was thinking about this particular game, right? And it was um, it was the first of January two th- no the first of January nineteen ninety four, going back a few years now, and this was the period where we were right up to the point of the sack the board, right? I mean, the Celtic fans were really frustrated with things the way they were going. And bear in mind, this was now 30 years ago because we're just about at the cusp of our 30th anniversary of the takeover. This was the January. And um, we played the New Year's Day game when it was still a New Year's Day game against Rangers. And they beat us 4-2, right? Now, tell me in your in the comment section if you were at this game because Rangers were 3-0 up after 28 minutes, right? 3-0 up at Celtic Park after 28 minutes. It was Mark Hately who scored in the first minute Mikhailachenko scored in the third, and then Mikhailachenko scored again uh, before the half hour mark. The Celtic fans were not happy. Somebody ran on the park and made a beeline for Ali Maxwell, the goalie, if you remember him, and the goal for, for Rangers. Listen to this for a Celtic side, guys, right? This shows you in the 30 years since the Fergus takeover, because he took over two months later. Um, this was a Celtic team. Pat Bonner and goals. Come back to Pat Bonner in a wee minute, because I'm going to be with him tomorrow night. Peter Grant, Gary Gillespie, Darius Dovchek, and Tom Boyd. There's your back four. Right, so I'm guessing that Boyd and Gillespie were playing centre-half with Peter Grant at right back and Dovchek at left back, I think. Um, we then had Paul Byrne, Pat McGinley, Paul McStay and John Collins. And up top, Charlie Nicholas and Brian O'Neill. Brian O'Neill who could play centre-half, centre-mid or centre-forward. Listen to the substitutes, right? Brian O'Neill came off in 51 minutes for Mark McNally. And Darius Dovchek um, came off after 61 minutes for Wade Biggins, right? On the bench for Celtic, an unused goalkeeper was Shea Given, who never played a game for Celtic, but let's wait, I wish he did. And at one point, uh, tempers were so afraid that someone threw a Mars bar in the direction of the Celtic board. Right, there you go. That's how far we've come in 30 years, right? And I've watched every single kick of the ball during that time. And I know there are going to be loads of people in the comments who were at that game. Um, so I think that it needs to be tempered at times. But I agree with Brian wholeheartedly. It doesn't stem from the stands. It stems from the pitch, Chris. It stems from the pitch. The frustrations that the Celtic fans had that day for one of them to run on the park. If you're in the comments section, admit it if it was you. And the other <laughs> one to throw a Mars bar at the directors. The, these frustrations came from the performance on the pitch. We were 3 nothing down after half an hour. It was absolutely dreadful. Look it up. A shocking performance. The frustrations boiled over. And they still do, Chris. It's natural. And that's what it's about. That's what the emotion of being a football fan is all about. Yeah. Um, couldn't agree more. I think, actually, to, to Brian's point, um, you know, the fans get frustrated with poor performances. But it, sometimes it's more about the commitment that they're seeing uh, on the pitch. Fans' commitment very rarely, if ever, wavers uh, when it comes to Celtic. Right? It doesn't matter where we are in the league; the guys turn up, you know. And it, and it doesn't matter how much money you make if you're high earner, low earner, uh, mid earner. You know, they, they spend so much money and so much of their time, um, you know, devoted to Celtic, um, and that's incredible commitment. And you know, there's many clubs that have similar supporters, but I. I, I I would struggle to, to say that there's any that doesn't more than our, our club, but I'm obviously biased. Um, but when, when that commitment is made by the supporters, um, going to the matches, you know, all weather, irrespective of the form, they're, they support the team, they're there to see the team win. And, you know, it's different if our guys give it a real go and maybe lose a late goal and it's like, oh, well, but at least you saw the commitment on the pitch. You know, we have got a forgiving group of supporters. I always go back to the Tommy Burns era when he was a, a manager, where we were playing some amazing football, but we couldn't beat that, that Walter Smith Rangers team. But by God, people look on that era really fondly, simply by virtue of saying the football was incredible. You know, there were some games that were absolutely tremendous. And and the players, you know, despite falling short, you know, there was a lot of commitment in that uh, in that team. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the things we've uh, we've suffered from this season uh, and why the fans have shown frustration, myself included, has been that, you know, we're watching guys like Lewis Palmer, for example. I don't want to pick on pick on the guy, but you know, a couple of matches back, you know, he loses the ball, smile goes up. You know, this maybe has way reacting to how the fans are 
uh, are, are proceeding the performance. But ultimately, you know, the optics matter when it comes to the when it comes to the fans as well. Um, you know, we want to see our players showing the same level of commitment that we as fans uh, show, and that's why we've got the standards we've got. That's why we always talk about passion. And if the players are given that, you know, even if we fall short of this of this season, it'll be a huge disappointment. But if the fa- if the players between now and then can give it a real go, a real dig, it'll be, be a lot. It'll really temper the the you know really temper the reaction. I think. Yeah, without a doubt. Someone, someone came in. I'm, I'm going to justify why I brought that game up here. Someone says, "Here we go. Why are we looking back to a time in the old course Benham though they didn't have?" Well, in three days' time, it marks the 30th anniversary of Celtic's takeover under Fergus McCann, and oh, how things have changed since then. We all know what happened uh, to the old co. We know exactly what happened there, and we know what happened to Celtic. And, and sometimes I think it is important to to look back uh, to to. Uh, appreciate where we are as a football club, but also to think to yourself, well, where are we going as a football club as well? That's very, very important. Um, and we can reminisce. Alan McDermott got in and we were already in tuna down. <laughs> 1994, 1st day of January. Uh, John Watt, here, here, Brian. It's all about standards. That's uh, aimed at yourself, Brian Degnan. Uh, we've also got Alistair Ross. I was at the game. It was terrible. Did you throw the Mars bar, though, Alistair? Um, I was there, Paul, says Martin Davey. Nobody's admitting to this Mars bar, or indeed the invasion of the pitch. Robert Little, everybody going mental after the third run, running around to the front of the stadium. Not happy at that point. Uh, that team would have beat Kilmarnock at home. <laughs> hey, by the way, there was, some decent, there was some decent players in that team. I mean, Dovjet came off for Biggin. Dovjet was a fantastic footballer, played in the World Cup in 1986. Uh, Paddy Bonner, Gave Henrik McLarson the fear. Uh, I'll tell him tomorrow night. I'm going to be with Pat Bonner tomorrow night and Roy Aiken in Sterling. Ticket link underneath this particular video if you want to come along. A few tickets uh, still available. Christopher Biggins would have been better than Wayne Biggins. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did get him to sign my programme one week. Don't know where that is. Don't think it's worth anything either. Um, we're going to run through the team. We've got to run through the team for the weekend. We'll start off with Joe Hart. Uh, Lloyd, Joe Hart has announced his uh, retirement at the end of the season. We don't have his replacement in. Surprise, surprise. We've got some people in the comments going on about Kelleher. Is that still something that we could do? Uh, I mean, are we going to be priced at the market? Brian's shaking his head. 15, 20 million pounds for a goalie. We're not going to do that, are we? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a perfect, that was Listen, a perfect I, I, response. I, 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 I love it, but no, let, let's be realistic about it. We know how that board worked, so no chance. Yeah, right. I'm going to I'm going to say that I think that there was a, a slight change in tact in the COVID season, um, and it scared them to the point where we are going to be very reluctant to pay anything five million pound and over for any player straight off the bat, unless they've been in the the building for a year on loan a la Carter Vickers and Jota Bernardo as well but I don't think we're going to be shelling at 6 million for him at this stage um, what, what do you reckon though in terms of Joe Hart Chris when we, we talk about his influence this season I think he's been huge um, even the other night you know you forget the fact that, that Dundee uh, were, were full of invention and um, in the first five minutes they had a really good chance that Joe saved leaving, leaving at the end of the season um I don't think it's unexpected, uh, but we're, we're, we're not well equipped for it. We're not well prepared for it, are we? Well, we don't seem to be. I mean, we don't know what's happening behind closed doors and with our recruitment team um, at the moment. But uh, no, I, I, I think Joe Hart, as I've said on the show before, will go down as, uh, or will be recognised, you know, for his contributions over the past uh, couple of seasons as a, as a really good signing. Uh, for us, I think he's done a, a magnificent job. Um, he's had a, a fantastic career, and hopefully, he ends it with some success at the end of this uh, this season. Um, but succession planning at the moment, um, based on what we what we know or, or what we can see, doesn't look great. Um, I would have loved to have killed her, and you know, either in the summer or at uh, you know in the January window. There, I think now when you see the performances being put in for Liverpool. Um, in the games that Allison's been out and in the cup games, etc., I think he would have been a, a tremendous signing for us. Uh, I've always said that. I don't think he's quite the finished article, but certainly looks much more assured than, say, a Barkas, for example. So I, I think whatever the, 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 the cost would have been, it would have been worthwhile, but we're not going to go upwards of 10, 15, 20 million. No, no way. I, I don't think that's going to happen. So the hope is that the recruitment team... Uh, 
you know, maybe Brendan, if he's if he's you know planning to stick around past this season, uh, have got someone in mind to come in and take over that that role. But I don't think it's just the it's just the first choice goalie. I think we've got to improve the backups as well. I mean, we've got two guys there who in Scott Bain and Seagrass, and listen, nothing against the two the, the two blokes. You know, don't see them in training. Don't know what their attitude's like. Not for me to judge. But they're not getting anywhere near the team, and they haven't they haven't looked like they're going to. Touch Joe Hart in terms of taking over that that, that first choice goalkeeper, um, goalkeeper position. So for me, Joe Hart's going. I think we need to shift the other two out, and we need to look at bringing in one real good cement the place first choice goalkeeper, and we need a strong backup, at least one strong backup to come in there. Whether that's a younger player with a lot of promise, um, or whether it's uh, uh, someone we bring in who's maybe a bit more experienced who can actually act as that. That buffer for the uh, you know for the for the first choice keeper and give him a give him a good strong uh, bit of competition, um, or as some have suggested, you know I don't know what his his plans are. I've not read what his plans are. Maybe Joe Hart will be kept around for his experience. Now I don't think being a great player, as I've said before, entitles you to come in and take on a coaching role, but maybe there is a, a, a role there for someone like Joe Hart to help with that transition to to a new keeper. But um, yeah, at the moment it's. It's probably one of the most worrying aspects about our, our summer recruitment, our summer rebuild, is that that's a position, that's a core position you really need um, to build your team uh, your team from. You know, it's, it's the foundation of a good team as a good goalkeeper. Yeah, and I think the uh, the kind of price we're talking, Brian, shows you how uh, replacing Joe Hart is going to be expensive. And, and that shows you the, the, the value of the man as well. Um, how long have we needed a quality backup because you could go right back to Brendan Rodgers' his first time in charge, where he brought in Doris De Vries. Uh, obviously, Scott Bain was a, a backup for for spells, and all this time later, we still don't have a decent backup. You go through the COVID season, we didn't know who the number one was because Bain, Hazard, and Barca has probably played twenty games each, so there or thereabouts, um, and we've stumbled from one season to the next. Um, I think Joe Hart was a phenomenal purchase at the right time. We really, really needed him. We'll look back on his role within the Ange Poster Coglu um, seasons as being key to the success. But we've never had that backup. I mean, and I agree with Chris, we can't run with Scott Bain. Scott Bain is in a position where at some point, Brian, he's he's decided I don't care if a player or not. I mean, I'm going to sign that deal. I'm going to take my wages. I'm happy being a backup. But he's not challenging the number one. And he's never going to challenge the number one. So, you know, obviously the priority is replacing Joe Hart, but I think Chris makes a good point. Where's your number two as well? Well, yeah, this is, it, it goes, it all goes back to my usual sort of moaning is there's no strategy in place. Now, look at Kelleher as an example, right? So you're talking 15 million for him now, so we're never paying that. And there is an argument to say we shouldn't play that for one player because we need at least probably six quality players coming in. So you're not going to play 15 pounds maybe a pound each, right? But anyway, that aside, if we had a strategy in place, we could have got him in a loan to buy last season when he wasn't featuring. We could have been a bit more aggressive to try and get the guy in then and paid five million for him and took the gamble. And then now he's played a few games, we're never getting anywhere near him. So it's that sort of shot, that sort of, well, we'll wait and see how, that sort of hesitancy to make these decisions always costs us because look at Castagna, Premier League regular starter. Again, he was at the airport, last minute change of deal, bit of hesitation. He goes, he's a Premier League right back. It's things like that. It's just these weird examples. Ivan Tony as well, classic one. And you think, we just need to be aggressive with this and, and get into, you know, a strategy and a mode where we can do it. And in Garden, Joe Hart, you know, I said before, I think what he's done is he, you know, he's come in and he's done a good job. He's been steady enough. I think he's, it's funny because the team's been worse under Rodgers, but he's probably been better under Rodgers than Ange. I think it's been a bit simpler, which is quite strange, but you're talking you're going to need two keepers in the summer, right? So that's two players. One, a starter, one, a solid, someone to compete with him. Then you need, still need a left-back, probably another centre-mid, maybe a striker if you don't say Madamida. You need to fix your winger situation. Do you need to cover it right back? So you, you suddenly you start to go, hold on a second, and that's without anybody leaving. So this rebuild is looking big. So I know we don't want to talk about transfers because we're fairly positive about the result, but that lack of planning, that's where it gets really concerning. Because you can get maybe a season, you can move maybe two seasons, but you get to that first season 
and you've got a massive mess. And if you look at the mess Ange walked into, it was a disaster. And we were all going, hold on, we need a whole new team. We managed to pull it off. And then two years later, or sorry, three years later, we're going to have to do something similar. Because when you see Hatati and O'Reilly go, for example, suddenly, you know, Macy, that's mostly spin your team. So that's where it gets a concern. Hope there's things going behind the scenes. There's, there's surely got to be some sort of plan in place. But then I suppose that depends on whether Rogers is going to be there. If he's just going to win the league and then ride out and the prodigal son that it will be complete for him. Listen, unless he gets emptied, he's going to be here for three years, right? Because he said that. Um, we're going to run through the entire team, uh, starting off with a goalkeeper. Uh, for anyone who's wondering why we're talking about goalkeepers, that did pop up on the comment section. Smell the glove. Press conference is usually one thirty, but Kennedy doing this one. So obviously, Rogers and McGregor were not at training at Lengstown this morning. Um, it sets off the rumour mill around an, uh, an injury, perhaps, to Callum McGregor. Let's hope that's not the case. We will talk about what we would do if it is the case. Esther Pona boy speaks about uh, Frank Haffey being better than Pat Bonner. Frank Haffey, right? Celtic goalkeeper. Celtic were beating Airdrie 9-0, right, back in the 60s. And we got a penalty. Goalkeeper Frank Haffey took it and missed it. And we won the game 9-0. And there's a wee fun fact for yes, the Pona boy, uh, about Frank Haffey. Did Pat Bonner ever miss a penalty? I don't know. I'll ask him tomorrow. Uh, we've also got uh, Maestro95. If Cal Mack is out, then Bernardo comes in. Going to ask the contributors their thoughts on that. But we're going to start with the fullbacks. Lloyd, I thought a massive part of the um, comeback against Motherwell and then the performance of the night was down to Johnston and Taylor. Their involvement, that you're coming in at form. Um, I thought Taylor started off pretty poorly against Motherwell, came on a really good game, ended up with that brilliant cross for Ida's header. Uh, Johnston, probably back to his best. Um, and they, along with Carter Vickers, have got Anaki really, really pushing the opposition back uh, and, and we can play a lot higher because of them. Uh, just at a key time as well. They're really coming into their own and coming back into form, I, I think, Lloyd. And it's it's so vitally important uh, to the way this team attacks. Yeah, 100%. It's funny you mentioned Johnson as well, and obviously his form, because obviously most of the season he's not performed to the level we kind of expected of him since he's come in. But especially the last two games, I've seen, I've seen him kind of get back to his best. Taylor, he's had... Last season he had a, a terrific season, but this season once again he's kind of not been off it because he's not played that kind of inverted position. But you've seen him kind of go back to that the last few games, and it suits him much better. And obviously the two of them are contributing with assists as well in the team, so that makes even better because obviously we've been on about delivery from wide areas this season because it's not been as good as what it, it was. But no matter what. That defence with Cameron Carter Vickers in it, you, you can tell a massive, massive difference in what he brings to the, the whole team because the whole team are just much more confident with him in it. And when he's there, fans are more confident as well. And if they gets a big lift because he is one of the key players of this squad. And without him, we are kind of not to say the other guys that came in aren't good, but there's there's different levels. The player there and Cameron Carter Vickers is one of the top quality players in this squad. He absolutely is. And I think that was a wee bit of a frustration going back to the summer where we sold it seven million quid on centre halves. And mm. you know, you, you just think to yourself, go out and buy someone of the same mould as Carter Vickers because uh you're right in what you say when he comes back in, the difference is huge. Um Chris, bit of, I would say criticism around Johnson's performances this season, but uh, I thought he was brilliant against Dundee, one of the best players on the park. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, I thought his application was was great. He looked up for a up for a bit of height actually, which given he had had a you know a, a pretty bad facial knock a, a few weeks earlier, I thought that was uh, it was nice to see that kind of edge to him again. He's always been a bit of a quite an aggressive, quite an assertive player. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think he's he, he, you know a lot of people like him. He's got a bit of dig about him, and I thought that was back uh, in the game. But as I said said earlier, his link up play with Yang uh, was excellent. The two of them looked to be on the same page. Um, you know, really good understanding, which you know that could pay dividends as, as we go forward. Um, you know, if they can carry that that, that momentum into the the you know the, the, the upcoming games. Um, but yeah, he's he's a player that you know I think we're very fortunate uh, in terms of our let's face it, not great recruitment uh, over the last couple of years. He's been the one really bright light, um, and there you know uh, 
it, it was tough to lose a player like Juranovic, but I think Johnston came in, made that position his own, um, has really played well, has cemented down uh, that, that right back spot. And I think, you know, if he's fit, he plays uh, at the moment. Uh, you know, we've got Tony Ralston there, can, can come in and do a good job at the, you know, a fairly solid job at, at that, um, you know, as a substitute. But I think, you know, Johnson's the, the number one pick uh, for that position. And when he plays better, the team plays better. Yeah, without a doubt. And a couple of birthdays, I want a big shout out to Martin O'Neill, 72. Martin O'Neill, yeah. 72 yeah. years of age. Uh, and also George Connolly, the great George Connolly, is 75 today. He was a player who uh, walked out in Celtic at the age of 26, having already played in a European Cup final in 1970. Uh, he was also in the Scotland squad for the 1974 World Cup. Finals, but he broke his ankle against Baal, um, unfortunately, and wasn't able to travel with Scotland. Scotland's Player of the Year, 1973, a, a class act, and from a wee mining village in Fife called High Valleyfield. So, big shout out to George as well. Uh, still a class act, I've got to say, George. Uh, James Devine, good afternoon. Wow, what a lineup today on Axon. Nearly as good as a back four on Wednesday. <laughs> well, I don't know who's who. I don't know who's who. I'll go scales, right? OK, because uh, maybe nobody else wants to be skills. I'll go skills. The Flying Haggis listening at 1.5 speed to catch oh, up. The right. things you do, the things you do to catch up on Axon. Um, and do, do any sound any better, Flying Haggis? Let us know. Uh, I'm worried, I'm worried about the speed I talk at, Paul John. Could you imagine the speed I talk at? If that goes at one and a half speed. I know. What to do, right, uh, Flying Haggis, is go and listen to my interview with John Barnes at 1.5, and I'm pretty sure you'll slow it down after a wee while. So are Celtic going to break the bank for Kelleher? If he fancies it, well, everybody in the comments is saying, no, no chance are we going to spend that kind of money. Uh, Van, well done, young James McKenzie from the Mary Wallopers. Spoke very well on Sky Sports. He did. He done very well, did young James. Uh, check out his blog and his musings on uh, action.net. Happy St. David's Day to John Hartson, Joe Ledley, Adam Matthews and Craig Bellamy. And let's not forget another favourite, Aaron Ramsey. How many other Welsh players have we had at Celtic? There must have been more. John Hartson, Joe Ledley, Adam Matthews, Craig Bellamy. Who else? Let us know. Let us know. Let us know in the comments if there are any others. Um, Adam Matthews was quite underrated, I thought. Could play both sides. Uh, Mikey boy, hail, hail all. I am still buzzing from the other night. That's what it does to you. I'm so excited for Sunday. Starting to believe again. Let's go and get this title. I was asked a question the other day um, from a, a reporter who is a student reporter who's a Hearts fan. Um, if I could sign two players from the Hearts team, who would it be? I found it quite an interesting question because I don't tend to think like that when I'm looking at an opponent. Um, Chris, I'm going to ask you the question. There's obviously there's an obvious one. If there was two players that you think would improve the squad, let's say, who would they be? Are there uh, two? Available now or just in general? Nah, just in general, because obviously there was all that chat around Lauren Shankland, wasn't there? Um, uh, I, I mean, I wasn't really on. I wasn't really on the the, the kind of Shankland train, to be honest. I, I didn't see him as really improving in what we what we had um, <laughs> what we had had there. Uh, I couldn't see how he'd fit into our, our uh, style of play. I mean, I think you know, good player, good good striker. And, We've spoken about the fact that we kind of turn our noses up a little bit at players in Scotland, which I think is, I think is unfair because there are there are some cracking players that we're producing at the moment, and we're seeing some of them doing well in other leagues as well. I think you know Lewis Ferguson, uh, being one of the more recent examples. And I tell you, I was really impressed with the boy Miller, um, seventeen-year-old at Motherwell. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind taking a punt on him uh, if I thought we'd, we'd give him some game time. Uh, he looked. You know, for 17 years old, the level of maturity he showed playing against us, and it's interesting. It's, it's one of the things that I, I used to I used to argue with my old man about this, about what would be the criteria for signing players within the Scottish league. Uh, and his view was he would never sign a player unless they played well against us. Um, but if a player played well against us, he said, "Well, that's worth looking at." You know, if he can really show it against, you know, uh, Celtic or, or even Rangers as well, actually, then he's probably worth looking at. Of course, we signed by the floods, and the less said about that, the the, the, the better. He's now um, a football. He's a football agent now. A little flood. Yeah, it just, just. I mean, to be fair, I used to watch him. It was, I think, it was at Dundee United. He was, he was with, if I remember right. And mm. he might be self a bow, but I never ever once thought he'd be the kind of player to come in and play for us. But yeah, I, I think the boy Miller would be the one that I would, I would, I would look at just now. I was really impressed uh, with him, and. <sighs> I'd still, still quite like to see Beck. Um, you know, I know he's a Liverpool player, but 
even though we kind of tore them apart on on Wednesday, I think there's a there's a player there that, that we could get the best from. You know, he, he would fit our style of play. You know what I liked about him, Chris, is he, we did tear him apart. I thought Yang gave him a right hard night, but he never once stopped. No, he kept, he kept coming back for more. That's what I liked about him. There was a character there that I thought uh, that's the type of player I like. Players yeah. that are built like that. Willow Flood started off his career at Manchester City. He actually played for Manchester City, the first team. Um, and the I think the other Hearts played, talking about Lennon Miller, Lennon Miller was at Celtic as a kid. Um, and he didn't leave because we didn't rate him. He, he left because there was other reasons for that. But um, yeah, he is a player. Uh, Brian, is there two players in that hat squad that you would you, you think would improve the Celtic squad? Um, I, probably you're probably talking Shankland. I think he's he's not better than Kyoko or Ida by the looks of it. But I think he's probably he's certainly more clinical than O. So you'd say maybe him coming in. Um, I think Craig Gordon would be good. <laughs> I don't know if he's ever heard of him. He might, he might be decent. Never left. He, I should never have left. I think he, he, I mean, you talk about backups, even a big guy like that, experience might be decent. Um, I can't, I, I can't think too, too many other players. The wee guy, um, Devlin, he is always a bit of a mischief maker when he plays us. He always plays well. He wee centre mid, but again, is he better than anything we've got? It's hard to say. If you're talking Scotland, the Scottish League wider, I agree with Chris. I'd sign the boy Miller in a second. I think, uh, I think he he looked looked like a real decent player. Obviously, Mayovsky. Um, there's, there's there's no loads with it, you know, just off the top of my head that I can think of. I think would walk in, um, but but we need to see. Um, but I tell you what, I'd rather see instead of signing young Scottish players, I'd rather just play uh, the boy Kelly again. I'd like to see more of him on Sunday because uh, I thought he came in in. in you know, physically he looked very strong, mm-hmm. you know, decent height, decent athleticism, thought he positioned himself well, scored a belt with his weaker foot, didn't look overall by the occasion. Has he performed any worse, you know, in a game than any other midfielders, Bernardo or home? I don't think so. So if we're looking at, you know, let's imagine Kalmak is injured, right? I know he's probably not, yeah. let's imagine. I, 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 think, I think there's no reason why the boy can't come in and, and see what he's got because... That's bold. That's yeah, a good, know, good shout. I, I, yeah, I know it's easy to come on it um, when you're six and all up, but you know we're still pressing. And actually, you know that the, there was a wee dip in, dip in the team in the second half, and he he for me looked really, really pretty comfortable in that company. So, you know, I I, I, I slotted Brendan a wee bit earlier. I gave him a wee bit of credit here for actually bringing one of the youngsters on when we're comfortable because we've not seen enough of that. Um, so I'd like to see him start and. Um, and just, just one other team selection that I would definitely start is Iwata. I thought he was man of the match the other night. I know Yang got most of the plaudits and Johnson was highly praised and rightly so. But for me, Yang, eh, sorry, eh, Iwata was, was excellent. I thought he was so calm, broke up attacks, was very strong, positionally excellent, got to every second ball, um, really knew where to be, really clever at spotting, you know, if Calm, if he was space, he would move forward, Calm would drop back. They looked at a good relationship. So I thought he was excellent. Actually, I thought he was man of the match for me. So he, Brian, he, did, you, did, did you notice on the, the Celtic Twitter page, the admin, they put up the nominees for man of the match. Awata wasn't one of them, but see if you looked at the comments, the amount of people that said Awata should have been the should have been the man of the match was... I, I thought it was a standout because I thought he'd done the simple things really well. As I say, I know Johnson, I thought, would have been second place because um, although Yang was excellent first half, I did think he dipped. Um, although it was his best performance, I thought Johnson looked back to his best. The energy spelled just real determination. Even though there was a bit of a bit of flare up with like Ida and the boy for Dundee and stuff. Johnson was right over it. He loves that sort of stuff. But for me, Wata was just excellent. Just cool, calm, never broke a sweat. Let Callum and O'Reilly. And I don't think it's any coincidence. By the way, O'Reilly's been a bit better the past two games since the Wats came in. I think a three man midfield really suits him. So, yeah, Iwata would be a, a dead set for me and I would like to see the boy uh, Kelly featured at least for a half hour. Well, we don't know what the situation is yet, Lloyd, with regards to Callum McGregor, but I think mm-hmm. uh, Brian raises a really good point, right? Because we're, we're constantly on here talking about the progression of our own academy graduates. Daniel Kelly's come in, done exactly what you would expect. You know, he, he really applied himself. But I think Mitchell Frame's done well this season. Rocco Vatter's yeah. done well. But uh, you're then faced with a situation where you've perhaps got an injury 
to one of the key players in the squad. Um, you're looking maybe at your squad, you think Bernardo's got games under his belt, uh, Odin Holmes back in training, he's got games under his belt, but you've got this young kid, Daniel Kelly, coming in. So uh, what do you do, Lloyd, if indeed Callum McGregor is injured? Um, it's time, cast, so it's a must win. Do you throw the kid in? Do you play one of the other guys who might be considered a safer bet? It's one of those things that obviously, but uh, this is where Brendan Rodgers earns his money, basically with these kind of decisions, because young Scottish guy, eighteen year old, didn't look out of place at all on Wednesday night for me. Generally, didn't. At one point, they had three players around him, and he held every one of them off. Still came away with the ball. He literally came in, done his job, brilliant finish. Why not? If he's got, if he has got to be a Celtic player for the future, why not? Because like these are the cool. games. These are the games that that will make you going to one of the toughest places in Scotland. Yeah, 100%. no, you're right. I mean, a 17 year old Peter Grant made his debut against Rangers. You know, did did not also make his debut up at Tyne Castle as well? Tyne Castle, yeah. yeah uh, so... You're right. Sometimes it is. It's it's the real test of the metal, Chris. You just what do you think? Are you you on that training thought? Do you think you would, or would you go safe? Play one of the other guys in midfield. Uh, well, first of all, I have it in good authority that the reason Brendan and McGregor weren't in the training or the press up today is because they're watching Axum. Just, just heard that. So, um, <laughs> that, that, that's my theory. I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> Hi, Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so, Brendan. But um, I think, um, yeah, I'm, I'm with the guys. I thought I thought Daniel Kelly came in, and I'm a big believer if you're good enough, you're old enough. Um, and I thought he came in and he looked well. Yeah, OK, look, well, we're well in control of the game at that at that point. But performance levels around him had dropped, and I thought he came in and he still played with a, a level of maturity um, and strength. So, uh, you know, instead of looking externally, maybe we've got to, now is a chance if we can, you know, see if we can do what we haven't done often enough this season and control games in the first half and get to a position where we're comfortable, use the opportunity to bring these guys in, right? Because, as we've seen, if it is a, an injury to McGregor, we might have to call upon them. And we want to make sure that they're, they're ready, they're up for it, they've had that bit of exposure, uh, and they've had the opportunity, and they can, they can bring the, the, the re-game to, um, you know, to the park. So, yeah, I, I would say if there's an injury to McGregor, and I don't know how far away Hitati is um, from coming back in, but you don't want to rush, uh, rush him back, although we're running out of time to bring him in uh, anyway. But, yeah, I would have no problem just putting Dan Kelly in that midfield. That's interesting. I'm going to ask you for your predictions in just a moment, but before I do that, Cara, can you remind us that Mars Bars were bigger 30 years ago? 100% they were. Uh, we are talking, of course, about uh, your choice of implement to throw at the Celtic board in 1994. Times have changed, but uh, there is a 30th anniversary in just a few days of Fergus's takeover. Brian Degnan, uh, I want a prediction from you at Tyne Castle this weekend. B1. B1 Celtic, I like it, confident. Oozing out of you there, Brian, brilliant. Lloyd? 3-0. 3-0, oh yes. And Chris? You're at it, Lloyd, You're just, that's the price is right me there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going, I'm going to mix that up then. I'm going to go 5-1. So I think, oh, I'll be covering the game, of course. I'm I'm going to predict, and it's not because I'm a pessimist, I'm predicting 2-1 Celtic, but I think Hearts will take the lead. Celtic will prevail. Celtic will get through this and, and win 2-1. Come and join us um, half an hour before the kick-off as we uh, will be covering that game, as we always do. Thanks, everybody, for getting involved in the comments. Give us a big thumbs up. Notifications bell. Give it a hit. Subscribe to the channel. And if you want to come and speak, to Roy Aiken in Park Bonner tomorrow night in Kiwi, which is near Stirling, apparently. Never been. I will be there tomorrow night. Tickets underneath the video. Thank you all for getting involved. Thank you to Chris, Lloyd and Brian for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind.